Jason Houston, world expert on Boccaccio, and by extension, all things medieval Italian literature, uh, runs the Gonzaga in Florence program here, uh, and is with his wife, Monica, who's also here tonight, and made a big commitment to being in Florence and living an Italiano here. So don't need further introduction. Over to you, Jason. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Can you all hear me with the microphone? Is that good in the back there? Uh, welcome everybody on Zoom as well. Uh, thanks for coming tonight. Um, I appreciate Simon's invitation to come here. It's always a pleasure to speak to this group because you're so interested, uh, knowledgeable, and friendly. Uh, and can't hear. Let me uh, make this better. How's that? Is that getting better? Yeah, if I touch it, it's, it's terrible. Still not so good. How about that? Now we can hear each other. Oh, you can hear me. I guess that's the important part. Okay. All right. Um, always great to come here to the British and, and speak to you. Um, I appreciate Simon's introduction. I was reading the, uh, the, the note he set out about tonight's event in which he talked about the brilliant Professor Jason Houston. And I remarked to my wife, I said, well, that's, that's awful, awful high praise for me. Uh, but then I remembered that you British people use brilliant a lot more than we Americans use brilliant. And it means something quite different, I think, in British English and in American English. And then my lovely wife reminded me that in Britain, they talk about dinner rolls as brilliant. So, uh, which is great, because it set the bar for me where it should be, that if I'm more interesting tonight than a dinner roll, I, I've, I've done what I'm supposed to do. So let's, let's hope so. Um, so I'm going to be talking about groups of poets tonight, many of whom you know and you'll recognize. And I put this image of six poets up in a talk about four poets, which is really a talk about three poets, because that's what I'm investigating. And that's what I'm presenting to you tonight is a work in progress. Um, I've spoken here at the British before about uh, my first big research project, my PhD dissertation that turned into a book, which was about Boccaccio as a dantista, about what Giovanni Boccaccio did, who I'm sure you've all heard of Boccaccio the Decameron, did in his work as an author, as an editor, as a biographer, as a commentator, to promote a cult of Dante. So I, mean, I was interested, and still I'm interested, about how these great poets inter intersected and interacted in, in, their, in, in their lives when they were alive in the 14th century. Um, the next project I undertook was, and I'm just finishing, is translating all Boccaccio's letters from Latin to English for the first time. And a, a number of other of his smaller works that no one really reads. But now we'll not have the excuse that no one wants to read Boccaccio's Latin because I've tra translated them with a colleague from Latin into English. And those will be published soon with uh, Itati's press. Uh, the Harvard's villa up on the Ports Fiesle. And that got me reading Boccaccio's kind of intimate uh, letters to friends and to colleagues in, during his life. And that's where I discovered uh, what I'm going to be, or started me down the path of what I'm going to be presenting today, which is a story about how canons are formed, how we have this idea of who were the important poets of the 14th century in Italy, the Tre Corone Fiorentine, which I'll talk about. But I wanted to start with this image of six because these numbers change. And these numbers of, and these ideas of who are important poets and who are important figures in the history of literature change. And I wanna maybe add a seventh. Or I wanna remember that there actually was another figure, Zanobi da Strada, who in the 14th century was put up there with those other three poets. So this one is Vasari's Sei Poeti. So we have on the left, Cino da Pistoia, followed by Guitone da Arezzo, who are poets that are Tuscan, not Florentine. Vasari is trying to create a Tuscan identity versus a Florentine identity. So he includes these non-Florentine poets. And then we've got the so-called Tre Corone Fiorentine, who we've all heard of. Petrarch with the royal crown, chubby little Boccaccio there in the back, and Dante on the right. And then another poet who Vasari adds, probably because some things that Boccaccio did also, a guy named Guido Cavalcanti, who's another Tuscan poet. So even here, 
we've got this concept of this group of poets that's changing and evolving. So what I want to talk about tonight is this guy who I've added, uh, not because I think he belongs there. He, I don't think he does belong there by merits, but because in an important period of Florentine history, the late 14th century, he was there. He was a part of that group. And I'm going to look at some evidence that is around town that you can go look at with your own eyes and provide you some details about why he was in the group and why he's no longer in the group. And that's going to be the story I want to tell tonight. Again, this is a work in project, uh, in progress for me. I'm thinking about, uh, like I said, I'm meditating on the idea of can cannons. Why do we create groups? Who's creating these groups? What are the motives behind creating groups of illustrious poets or politicians or artists? Why is Michelangelo great if we talk about art, art history? Who decided that? Well, but sorry, I something to do that as well. But that's not my subject. My subject's poetry. So this idea of pre corone fiorentine. Have you heard of the three crowns of Florentine literature? Is that a, uh, something you've heard of before? An Italian, the Italian in the audience has heard of it for sure. Okay, this is a common, both ancient, meaning from the era, from the Middle Ages, but also contemporary designation for Dante, Petrarca, and Boccaccio, the three Florentine crowns. And the oldest citation we have is from this text I put up here in Italian, just to let you see some original Italian from the late 14th century uh, by this Gerardi da Prato, who in an introduction to a work called Paradiso dei Alberti, which is a poem kind of modern on the Divine Comedy, he says, Scusi me ancora la grandissima voglia che continuamente mi sprona. Excuse me, this desire that continually motivates me for the Italian language, the idioma materna. That's what's interesting to him is that he's going to continue to write in Italian and not Latin. Because he wants to exalt the Italian language, just as come che da tre corone fiorentine principalmente già nobitato ad essere si sia. So these tre corone fiorentine he'll go on to explain are Dante, Petrarca, and Boccaccio, who have exalted the Italian language by writing in the vernacular to a level of international literary excellence. So that, that's the only citation we have of these three people being connected to this idea of being three crowns. And it arises from the late 13th, 14th century. And it's connected to the fact that they were writing in Italian and that their language, their use of Italian was creating a noble language, a literary language that could compete with Latin. But that interest will change in, in um, deciding what's noble and what is worth recognizing in poetic nobility. So that's, that's part of the story that's gonna unfold here about Zenobia and his role. By the way, these are the three statues of the three Re Corone Fiorentina. You might recognize them from the Uffizi Gallery, the, the, the uh, Loggiato dei Fizi, the area outside. This and Michelangelo's were the first three built. Dante's was the first statue placed, then Michelangelo, then Petrarch, then Boccaccio. So it shows their kind of centrality to the, the, this idea of Tuscan and Florentine excellence. And that was all done in the mid 19th century around the time of the Risorgimento. Oh, we went backwards. What an ugly picture, because this is not something you've probably seen before, but it's a fresco here in Florence. And it's a fresco you can find if you like fish uh, for dinner, because that's a place called Fishing Lab. Fishing Lab is on Via Proconsolo, and this is the old Palazzo dell'Arte dei Giudici e dei Notai. And I recommend going there to eat. Not net, well, the food's fine if you like fried fish. Uh, but because if you can get a reservation to sit upstairs, you can sit under these incredible frescoes from the late 14th century that were commissioned uh, for the, the Palazzo when it was still the Palazzo of the Giudici e Notai, the judges and the notaries, the kind of legal branch 
of the Florentine Republic in the late 14th century. And here we have this fragment of a fresco with four figures. And it's hard to see because obviously it's in quite bad shape. On the left, you can see the face. It's a poor picture because there's not a lot of discussion. This was only unearthed about 20 years ago. So it hasn't really entered into the circuit of art historians so much yet. There's not a lot written on it yet. On the left, the figure, I don't know if this pointer has a laser, but on the left, you see the figure in red, the face. That's probably the oldest portrait of Dante we have, or one of the oldest, that and the one in the Bargello. On the right is Boccaccio. And there's two figures. You can see, you can kind of see uh, a book. I know it's very fuzzy. And then over here, you see another figure in the dark, in the dark toga. On the left here is a lighter robe that's, that's faded, but you can see a white blob, which is actually a book showing that there are four figures. And these four figures, these other two missing, are Petrarch on the right and Zanobi da Strada on the left. So this was commissioned in the 14th century, um, late 14th century. Probably, we have good evidence that probably in the 1370s when Boccaccio was still alive and Petrarch which is in itself quite remarkable to have a painting of a living person on a wall as a famous illustrious person. Usually that's Romans, dead people that have been, or saints, people that have been dead for a thousand years get to be painted on a wall. Here we have an image. So how do I know that, uh, how do scholars know? That's the question, right? Yeah, you can say who that is, right? Well, I'm excited because I found something very recently that confirms what I've been reading. So this was the, the, the head of this guild at this time was a, name, a man named Domenico Silvestri, who was good friends with the chancellor of Florence, Coluccio Salutati. To make a long story short, it's a very long story. He had his Zibaldone, his, his kind of personal book he would take notes in. And in this book are four Latin poems epigrams dedicated to Dante, Boccaccio, Petrarca, and Zenobi da Strada. And in the margins of that book, he writes, these, are the these poems have been written next to the images of these four people in the Palazzo of the Notae Giudici. So not only do we know that those four were there, but we also know that he wrote poems that were there right under their figures, lauding, you know, praising them. And so we have a sense of this group of four. And this is contemporary with that poem I studied in the previous slide that talked about the three. So we've got this battle happening or this difference of ideas. And what does he love these people for? He loves Dante for obviously his poetic genius and his visionary ability to erase his crime of, of baritry. He was exiled from Florence, supposedly for being a, a, a grafter, a corrupt, and writing the Divine Comedy. He praises Petrarch for resuscitating the beauty of Latin bucolic poetry. He praises Boccaccio for writing genealogical texts that bring back the great classical myths. And he praises Zanobi da Strada for translating from Latin to English. So the interest here is not the vernacular. The interest here, this grouping has to do with the fact that these guys, with Dante is an exception, but the three Petrarch, Boccaccio, and Zenobi are cited for their ability to write in or translate from Latin to English. Not English, sorry, <laughs> from Latin to Italian, or sorry, sorry, not English, they're not writing in English. I know what the British Institute would like to think so, but no, they're writing, they're writing in Italian. So, because that's what Zonobi was, was a vulgarizza he was, he was translating, and Petrarch and Boccaccio were both writing in Latin, but also writing in Italian, kind of, doing a cultural translation from Latin. So it's another value than what we saw in that previous uh, text where it was their ability in Italian. 
here it's this pre-humanist phase. That word humanist is we we hear a lot associated with Italy, with Florence, with the Renaissance as humanist. This is the first kind of recognition of what they're bringing. These three pre-humanists are bringing to the culture of the 14th century, 15th century, to the early Renaissance, is this idea of the ability to process, read, write, bring forth Latin culture. And so these three, these four figures represent that each in their own way in this painting. There are two more examples of this four grouping that no longer exist, but the same Domenico Silvestri cites when he's writing about in that same book, the Zibaldone, talks about this. And there, both of these are still under the influence of Coluccio Salutati, who's kind of the hidden, hidden voice here, who's the chancellor of the Republic of Florence, another very important early humanist. First project, in Palazzo Vecchio, there were four illustrious poets represented. Those four are these four. And that room has been changed completely in the Renaissance. So they're gone, but records show that those four figures were represented in Franco Vecchio as famous Florentine poets. And the project uh, that started in the 14th century, but didn't come to completion ever, but we'll end, I'll end my talk talking about where that ended, um, the Duomo. In 1396 as well, they proposed, Coluccio Salutati proposed building a memorial arch in the Duomo and to bury the four Tuscan poets who were no, not buried in Florence, because none of these four Florentines are buried here. Dante was exiled and is buried in Ravenna. Petrarch never came to Florence in his life. Like he passed by once and went on the outside of town and had all of his friends come get, visit him on the outside of town. But he's Florentine by, by culture, by family. Boccaccio is buried in Certaldo. And even he in his later life was kind of not exiled, but kind of on the outs of Florentine political culture. And Zenobi da Strada, who is buried in Avignon because he finished his life as the chancellor to the Pope in Avignon in 1361. So these Florentine poets needed to be brought back to Florence and buried in the Duomo. Of course, that never happened, but we'll see what happened instead of that at the end of my, uh, my talk. All right, so I wanna go into detail. I got a point, where do I point? Point here. There we, oh, I went too fast, look at that, I gotta go back. Sorry, technology. Now it's going to move all quickly or not at all. All right, it's moving now. Okay, now we'll go. So I want to talk about why Zenobi da Strada got eliminated from this group. I talked a little bit about why he was a part of this group, and I want to talk about the story between Boccaccio, Zenobi, and Petra. These four figures, Dante will leave to the end because he's kind of not contemporary with these folks. Um, and this story of friendship turned sour that leads to this decision or this attempt by um, the group to kind of exclude one or the other. And this is the fruit of the work I did on the letters. Right, now I gotta go, I gotta go ahead one slide, so let me hope it works. Okay, good. So friendship. Boccaccio and Zanobi were great friends. They're both were trained in Florence, studied in Florence under Zanobi's dad. That's, anybody know where Strada and Chianti is? That's Zanoba da Strada, Strada and Chianti. Um, they both were from that area and they both studied grammar, rhetoric, and logic with Zanobi's dad. Um, and they were great friends, so much so that, Don, that Boccaccio writes these letters to Zanobi. This is the work that I've been doing, translating, um, about how important their friendship was. And excuse me, we're going to be reading a little bit of text tonight because I'm a literary scholar, so that's what we do. I put some images up there to keep you interested, but I'm a words person. So this is Boccaccio to Zanobi in 1348. 
Zenobi's born in 1312, uh, Boccaccio in 1313. So they're about the same age. So they're in their mid-30s here. Boccaccio says, how pious, how holy, how venerable is the spirit of friendship. Who could ever explain it in the proper words? Not I, even if God had given me a hundred mouths, sounding with tongues and great genius and all of helicon. Frequently, this friendship exceeds the law's most powerful nature. For although the highest mother of all things often joins together mortal bodies through blood relations, nevertheless, the divine spirit of Prometheus, who died in a vile prison because of his most clever trick, will not prevail in binding them together in the ancient manner of bodies unless this sweet spirit intervenes. So friendship is, is so important to Boccaccio. And he's expressing to Zenobi their friendship. What, how do they become such close friends? Not only are they are in Florence at the same school together, but they are both moved to Naples at the same time, around 1330, uh, because the Bardi Bank, and who they're all associated with, is doing business with King Robert of Naples. And they follow their family interests to Naples, and then they become this little Florentine clique in Naples. And there's a third person who we'll talk about later, but right now we'll focus on these two friends. And they dedicate themselves in Naples to literature. And they are experiencing French literature, courtly romance literature. Think of the Arthurian cycle, the Carolingian cycle, Chrétien de Troyes, the great French tradition of romance poetry. They're reading that in a French court in Southern Italy with their Tuscan background. So this is a great melting pot of intellectual cultures and they're at the center of it. And it really determines a lot about who, the camp, who Boccaccio is, this experience. But he makes friends and he has this group with Zenobi. The same letter, look at how he finishes this letter about their friendship. Moreover, I beseech you by our friendship and by the faith of friendship that if, you're, if, that if your muse saying any new songs after my departure, let me see them. This is a lifelong occupation that they're exchanging poems with each other. They're writing pieces of literature, the muse, so we assume poetry, but not only. Romance poems, epic poems in Italian, probably in Latin. And this is a, a, a key we have to their friendship is this exchange of literature between the two. We don't have any of Zenobi's literature. Why not? We have all of Boccaccio's. So a lot of what Boccaccio wrote in Naples is part of the canon of, 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 of Italian literature. These romances, these, these epic poems, the Tezeda, stuff that Chaucer stole, sorry. Uh, a, a lot of that was written in Naples under that Nepo Neapolitan culture. But Zenobi, we don't know. So it starts out in friendship, this relationship between the two. The third character is Niccolo Acciaioli, who was part of this Florentine group that went to Naples. Niccolo Acciaioli comes from the banker family. So he's the rich one of the three. And he's not so interested in, in letters, in writing poetry. He's interested in making a career, and he does. Probably because he was sleeping with the king's wife. But for other reasons, he rises quite quickly in the kingdom of Naples, which means all of Southern Italy, Sicily, a lot of what is now Greece and Turkey and uh, Bulgaria and Albania, the old Thrace, was all part of this kingdom of Naples, a huge swath of territory. And Niccolo at the court, in Naples with his two buddies, Don, uh, Zenobi and Boccaccio, he makes a political play and rises to the level of being the grand seneschal of the kingdom of Naples by the 1340s. So while Zenobi and Boccaccio are writing letters back and forth and practicing their poetry and writing some, a little bit of epic poem in French, a little bit in Italian, a little bit in Latin, Niccolo Acciolo is, is making tons of money, is a general, he's out on the battlefield, sleeping with who he needs to sleep to, with to get to the top of this huge dynasty. He becomes super rich. And he comes from a rich family already. So by the time Boccaccio and Zanobi come back to Florence in the early 1340s, they come back in 1340, they're both interested in having Niccolo's support patronage. So this idea that you're going to hear about the Medici next week, you all know that patronage drives Renaissance uh, art. Well, here's where it starts to drive literature. This is really the period where people like Boccaccio, like 
not even Dante was looking for patrons. He had some help, but that wasn't really part of his world vision. I got to find me a rich person to support me. Even though he was in exile, he was more looking for a bed to lie his head in. These guys are looking for a patron. And Zenobi is the one that hooks Niccolo as his patron. So much that Zenobi becomes the court poet for Niccolo Acciaioli in Naples. But Boccaccio wants a little bit of piece of the action. So here's a letter we have from Boccaccio to Niccolo Acciaioli. See in 1341. So just briefly after it, he returns to Florence. Now Niccolo is not back in Florence. He's making money around the Mediterranean, winning wars. Listen to how he addresses Niccolo. He's asking for his patronage. I swear to you by my stricken heart that no differently was the departure of Aeneas, sad to Carthaginian, Carthaginian deed, Dido, than was yours to me. Similarly, the return of Ulysses was awaited with no greater desire by Penelope than yours by me. Oh my God, a boss, oh, right. And Paul, see, no, so he's the big hero. Boccaccio's the little wife at home waiting for him to come and make everything right. Come back to Florence or at least send me some money while you're here. Just as Alexander the Great transmuted the pirate Antigone's bad fortune into good, in this way I hope you can change mine. Can you help me out a little bit? Boccaccio's complaining about money all the time. Up to his death, he's complaining about money. He does all right though actually, but he's, he's always looking for some support. And here he's asking to convert friendship into patronage like his buddy Zenobi did, like his buddy Zenobi did. But it doesn't really work. And we'll see as we go along that this, this friendship and patronage turns into something else. Anger. Why did I put the Certosa up here? Because at the beginning, it did work a little bit. So in 1342, Acciaioli commissions Boccaccio to be his lawyer, his procuratore. Because Acciaioli is so freaking rich, he doesn't want to come back to Florence because of the taxes. Sound familiar? So he says, I'm going to start a monastery, wink, wink, outside of town, and I'm going to buy up all the land around it because it's going to be a Carthusian monastery that can't have any contact with people. Those Carthusians, you know, they like to stay in the middle of nowhere and have no contact. So I've got to buy this whole swath of land called Galuzzo now, and I'm going to build a monastery called the Certosa di Galuzzo. And so Acciaioli gives power of attorney to Boccaccio, who signs the documents for the purchase of the land that becomes the Certosa Galuzzo and the city of Galuzzo. So he gets a little bit something. He probably takes a nice percentage. He's a lawyer. Takes a percentage. Sorry, lawyers in the room. He takes a percentage off that. But that's really the end of their, that we hear about them working together. Until I'm jumping ahead chronologically just to finish this part of the story, then I'll go back a little bit. Because Boccaccio now, later in life, after Zanobi dies in 1365, Acciaioli says, now, Boccaccio, you can be my court poet, now that Zanobi's dead. Come down to Naples. I'll treat you right. You can have all the things you wanted to have before. It doesn't go so well for Boccaccio. And I'm going to read you some long passages because they're Boccaccio at his greatest, his best. We love Boccaccio for telling a good story. And this is a letter that Boccaccio wrote in response to the treatment he received by Niccolo Acciaio in Naples, which wasn't very good. So this is the people that Niccolo made him eat with, not at the noble table, but I ate with, I call them gluttons and gobblers, playboys, muleteers and field hands, cooks and dishwashers, in other words, dogs of the court and domestic mice, the greatest consumers of leftovers. What an insult. Now here, now there, they run about filling the house with the grating mooing of cows. And that which was most difficult for my sight and smell, they would often break the pitchers and vases of wine, softening the dirt below, so that their feet mixed with wine and dirt, creating a mud that filled the air with a place with a fetid odor. Alas, how many times was my stomach not only irritated, but also forced to vomit. This letter is 17,000 words long. It's a book. Just one letter, but it's a book for me. I had translated over six months of complaints about how he was treated by Niccolo Acciaioli trying to make good on this patron. More, just because it's fun. 
And this is making fun of Niccolo Acciaioli for his uh, attempts, well, for his feeling like he's a lord. We often see him sit among the most important men speaking and reciting little stories that make the ladies already know, that the ladies already know, because I wrote them, is what Boccaccio is saying, right? I wrote the Decameron. They already know these stories. And sometimes he spits out some words that sound like he knows Latin, and he makes a show of his books and reads his bad poetry. For these things, not to mention the others, should I not be horrified to use my best style to praise him? Am I going to be a patron of this guy? Or a client of this guy? And the enemy of the muses, well, I say he's my friend. My, may God forbid that this shame come to my quill. And I should not fear that you who are a literate man, he's not writing to Niccolo, he's writing to a friend in common, should be surprised at this. So this, conver this conversion to patronage doesn't go so well. And this, so, and we'll finish, I think there's one more. And this is about Zenobi, who's recently died. Zenobi was his court poet and was his client. And remember, Boccaccio wanted to be his client, but couldn't be. So this is building up this, this rivalry that is going to come to fruition here. Moreover, he's talking about all the things that Acciaioli thinks he's done that are great. Moreover, that he has given Cordian, this is the bucolic name for Zenobi da Strada. This is his pen name. He has given Cordian to believe that he is worthy of perpetual glory because he's made a monastery with a few buildings. Now he's going back to the Certosa that he helped found Boccaccio. Oh, laughable stupidity to have thought this, not only, have, not only having believed this, the monastery being such a little thing. If <laughs> little, I wouldn't say. Uh, but actually, most of that is from the 16th century. The part that uh, Acciaioli had built is this Palazzo Acciaioli, which is a square part on the left which is still there, it's the Palazzo Acciaioli. So it wasn't like this in Boccaccio's time. Maybe it was a little bit. If I know the, well the habits of this man, I think he has trusted entirely the words of Cordon, Cordion, who has said that he has built a glorious thing like the Tower of Babylon in the East, or the Pyramids of Egypt, or the Mausole uh, Mausoleum of Halicarnassus. So Boccaccio is so mad he's ridiculing not only Acciaioli and now Zanobi, for praising this guy who thinks he's all that, all that. But he's also going back on something that he himself, Boccaccio, had a hand in, right? Boccaccio himself was the person that was part of this tax scheme to help actually get all of his money back in Tuscany without paying taxes on it by building a monastery. Mm -hmm. Mostly not. So you got to piece a lot of it together by... With Zenobi, I'll get to that, but there's very little left of Zenobi. So we've got to take, uh, actually, there's some, but not so much. Uh, now, Francesco Nelli, we've got, and a lot of these letters, we have kind of responses to Petrarch, because Petrarch, we're going to get to Petrarch, is kind of out here floating above all this, trying to mediate this battle, because they're all his uh, followers in his own eyes. So Boc Boccaccio's mad about this, about Zenobi, and about this, uh, this, this problem with his patron. So I'm going to try to skip ahead without skipping too far. So bear with me. I got to be patient, which I'm not patient. So we're going to talk about Petrarch now, if I can get to the right slide. Who you all probably know. Um, there's our little boy. I'm going to actually move ahead to the next citation because I want to step back in time a little bit. I'll talk about the relationship between Boccaccio, Petrarch, and Zanobi. Because tre corone fiorentine, Boccaccio, Dante, and uh, who am I say? Petrarch, and this fourth figure. So what do we know about Petrarch? He was an incredible humanist. He was one of the first modern men, we call him, because of his fragmented view of himself. He was a European star. He bounces around, not from small court, but from papal court to imperial court, to Rome. The papacy wasn't in Rome, but at that time, it was in, it was in Avignon, Avignon. I called it Babylon. That's what he would have called it. So he's, Petrarch is playing at the highest level, and he's so important, he doesn't need patrons anymore. The miracle of Petrarch is that he starts as a patron of a very important family, the Colonna family, but then convinces enough people to give him fixed positions that have annuities that he doesn't need patrons anymore. 
So he gets, he's the bishop here and the count there. He's got all, no, he's not a count anywhere, but he's got a lot of ecclesiastical benefices that he accumulates, that he becomes rich just every month by the checks that come in so he can forget about his patrons. So that's the miracle of Petrarch, an important figure. So important that he's crowned the poet laureate of Rome for the first time since the second century. And Boccaccio writes about this. And this is what he says about the coronation of, of uh, Petrarch as poet laureate. On April 9th, in the year of our Lord's incarnation, 1341, in the ninth indiction, in the 37th year of Petrarch's life, in the city of Rome, on the highest point of the Capitoline Hill, in the presence of all the clergy and laity, one of these centers, that is to say, Lord Orso dei Orsini, knight and most noble count of Anguilara, solemnly crowned Petrarch as poet with a laurel wreath. After the same man's eloquent, extensive, and remarkable oration and glorification of the muses and himself. And after Lord or Orso himself gave a speech in praise of the poet who was so crowned. And with the utmost eloquence, he bestowed on him the special right, not only of his own clear declaration, but also of Roman citizenship. And he endorsed it properly with a golden seal, embossed with his emblems that for a long time come and commanded fear and respect in equal parts. That had not happened there since the most worthy coronation of Statius, the Roman poet from the second century of Toulouse, who is thought to have been crowned in the reign of Domitian in the 834th year of the city's family. So at Petrarch's own idea, by the way, he's crowned the poet laureate of Rome, an honor that Virgil had, I think Ovid had, Statius had, and now Petrarch has. And this is the kind of calling card for Petrarch to to go anywhere he wants in the world. And this is Petrarch, the poet laureate. But what happens? I went too far ahead again. This is the best quote of them all, of course, we can't miss this one. This is the quote of them all. In 1355, Niccolo Acciaioli, still alive, his creature, his poet, uh, court poet, Zenobia Strada, are making a pact with the German emperor, the, the Holy Roman Emperor, Charles III. And Niccolo tries to get a little extra. He says, why don't you go ahead and crown my poet, poet laureate, in Pisa, of all places. So certainly in 1350, certain enough, in 1355, Zenobia Strada is crowned poet laureate by Emperor Charles III in Pisa. You think that sat well with Petrarch? No. It didn't set well with Boccaccio either. So here's a letter from 1369 after Zenobi's dead, after Niccolo Accio is dead, but Petrarch and he are still alive. And here's Petrarch Boccaccio writing to a young humanist in Sicily, Jacobo Pizzinga, saying what you need to do to be a great poet and a great humanist. And I obviously I've skipped a lot, but what he says is read the great Tuscan poets, read Dante, read Petrarch. He doesn't say read me, but you're reading me right now. You're reading my letter. Don't read Zenon. Desirous of glory, he, Zenobi, flew away to honors that I'm not sure he merited. And bringing down an ancient rite, he took on his brow the Pisan, not Roman laurel, from Bohemian Caesar. Content to be pleasing to one man, Niccolo Acciaioli, for a few poems, he came to regret having taken this honor. Attracted by the desire for gold, he moved to Western Babylon Avenue and fell silent. So Boccaccio changes the story. And this letter that's reproduced many times in many manuscripts because it's Boccaccio, he tells everyone, specifically this Jacopo Pizzinga, but these epistola, these letters are meant to be read publicly. Zonobi doesn't belong because he took the laurel crown, which was Petrarch's, and he didn't deserve it. And he didn't write enough poetry. 
Remember this question about tra translation doesn't count, perhaps. So Boccaccio is somewhere in between there. Okay. So the question, the, 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 a question is how influential could Boccaccio be? How is one letter going to change the course of history? The fact that he's a poet laureate, that he's already represented in these years, he's being represented in the places I talked to you about. That's what I'm trying to discover. I'm trying, and I'm not there. This letter is one of the most repeated letters. But there's also the stuff we as historians, literary historians, can never know. Word of mouth. Boccaccio is part of a circle of, of people that includes Petrarch and many others that are exchanging letters formally, but are also exchanging information amongst themselves. And this decision to exclude Zenobi must have had some importance. I said to you before, nothing of his exists, not because he didn't write it, because no one's looked. Uh, there's some, there are some poems we found that are in like Archivo Storico Lombardo, so a small publication from 1867, but he's been erased from literary history, like the person you talked about last week. There are all these folks that for some reason, Simon was telling me this was the week of obscure figures at the British Institute, right? It doesn't mean they didn't write. I'm, I can't say about his literary value. Maybe he was just a bad poet, but we don't know because his works haven't been collected and edited and published. If I had more time, it'd be something maybe I could do, but it's a challenge. You have to go look. So there's, we know there's stuff out there. His most important contribution was the translation of the Moralian Job. If you know, that's a book that's about this thick, Pope Gregory the Great into Italian from Latin. And the Dream of Scipio, this the Ciceronian text. So he, he adds an importance, but it's this fact that he took the laurel crown and offended Petrarch and offended Boccaccio in, in that way. So I, I said we would go back to Dante because we're talking about the Tei Corona. So I want to finish um, and talk a little bit about why Florence cares so much about poets and why perhaps Zenobi's been forgotten in light of all that we've heard about. This is what came of that project of 1396 to bring Dante, Boccaccio, Zenobi, and Petrarch's bones back to the Duomo. This painting is a direct result of that. It was commissioned in 1460 as a response to this by Leonardo Bruno, who came after Colucci Salutati, to recognize the birthday of Dante, 1465, 13, 1265 Dante's born. So 200 years later, Florence wants to recognize Dante for his contribution, even though they've exiled him. And I put these lines up here, which are from Dante from Canto 25 of Paradise, where he talks about why and in what condition he'd ever want to come back to Florence because he was in exile and he could have come back at any point if he would have admitted his guilt and paid a penalty, but he never did, he, he never did. And because in the end of his life, he finishes Paradiso when he's almost dead in 1321, Canto 25 of Paradiso, so eight canti from the end of it, he talks finally about what conditions he would want to come back to Florence. If it should come that this sacred poem, divine comedy, this work so shared by heaven and earth, that it has made me lean through these long years of exile, can ever come to the cruelty that bars me from the fair sheepfold where I slept, a lamb opposed to the wolves that wear on it, the political problems that Dante had in Florence. By, by then with an, another voice, with another fleece, I shall return as poet and put on at my baptismal font the laurel crown which he never had. He was never crowned poet laureate. It was 100 years later, 20 years later, that, 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 Bocat, that Petrarch starts this. But I want you to note that Dante says, I can't come back as a political figure. Dante was exiled because he was a political figure. And he was on the wrong side of a, of a, of a spat between two parts of Wells. He says, I'm done with politics. I want to come back as a poet. Dante himself creates this idea of a citizenship based on poetic genius, based on poetic ability, based on the ability to be an ethic, a moral, ethical poet um, for Florence. And Boccaccio 
in his own way and Petrarch in his own way want to follow this. Zanobi, we don't know. We don't know whether he did or not. But it certainly didn't help that he had friends like Boccaccio, who translated this love, this friendship more powerful than nature into anger. And then really in the end, this jealousy and in the end, this betrayal. And I love Boccaccio, he's my guy. But you, you, can't, you can't hide the story that, 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 that I found in these letters between Zenobi, Petrarch, uh, and, and Boccaccio. So that's where I'll end. I'm sure you have some questions. Uh, so, by the way, I've learned from Simon to do self-promotion uh, of my institute. So this is a conference we're holding at the Certosa uh, about stuff, just to put it up there. But um, thank you all for your attention. And I'm happy to hear your comments and questions. Well, thank you very much indeed, Jason. That was a tour de force. A lot of original research there. So. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, it's a bit of work in progress. Yeah. So uh, I presented here before where I presented my book that I'd written about Boccaccio, where, which was much more, I had my ideas and here they are. This is me, I'm, this is a work in progress. I'm trying to figure out how these groupings are made uh, and, and pull some evidence out from the record. Yeah, yeah. and, and is, is anybody else working on some of it? <laughs> Oddly enough, no. No, yes, there, there, are, there are some folks uh, that, um, there's a young scholar named Valentina Rovere, Rovere who's, uh, who's actually in Finland now, but she's from uh, Milan, that's working on Zenobi as well. People know about him in, in these circles. But again, someone needs to, a young person, needs to get an addition together of his works, because we need to be able to read them and make that judgment, I think. Fascinating. Anyhow, as always, um, if you're on the Zoom and want to talk to us, you can unmute un, uh, yourself and talk and we'll hear you in the room. Or you can put something in, in the comments and I'll, I'll, in the chat and I'll pick it up for you and read it out. Um, but in the room, as we're already getting, the hands are going up. So we'll, we'll go straight to... Yeah. Fantastic talk. This was really, really enlightening. Thank you. But my question, uh, you commented that Petrarch kind of mediated between all this. Are there letters from Petrarch that um discussed whose Absolutely. side of this that he was yeah. on or uh, petrarch thanks for the question because it's part i had to cut <laughs> uh petrarch um doesn't come out and say here's what he says about zanobi's crowning as poet laureate he says two things he says to zanobi himself he says do you think germans should be deciding about italian poets because <laughs> that's charles of bohemia is a german uh Emma. Well, I guess we call it a Czech or whatever, uh, but a non-Italian, non-Latin. So he, he, he says to Zenobi as a subtle critique. <laughs> Do you really think Germans should be doing this? Uh, really subtle, yeah. And then both in, in a less vehement moment, Boccaccio in 1355 and Petrarch at the same time says, okay, Zenobi, you've got the lower crown. Well, write something. You know, get, get back to work. Because the sense is that his job as papal secretary, first as court secretary and court poet. Then he's appointed uh, the prelate at Monte Cassino in southern Italy, which is very important for humanism, by the way, because because of that, Petrarch and Boccaccio can come into that library and find Latin texts. So many of the Latin texts we have from uh, Cicero, for example, and Ovid come from the fact that Zenobi was the prelate at Monte Cassino and invited Petrarch and Boccaccio to come in and raid the library. And uh, for example, the Ibis of Ovid, Boccaccio finds in Monte Cassino while he's there. So that's the other comment that Petrarch makes is, get writing, get writing, stop, stop doing all this uh, business, get to writing. So thank you. Um, my question is, if Boccaccio was seen as the better poet, why did Ascioli choose Zenobi as his court poet and not Boccaccio? Ah, I wish I knew. Uh, I can speculate. Yeah, great question. Yeah, these are the things that come out when you start to deal with this kind of level of this friendship, because it truly was a friendship from what we understand. I can speculate that uh, one unfortunate reason is that Boccaccio is a bastard. 
Uh, he doesn't have, he's born, he doesn't know who his mom is. He's kind of a natural son of his dad, although his dad completely brings him into the family. He doesn't have the, the prereq, uh, the pedigree, maybe to hold some of the positions that actually, or have some of the meetings that actually expects of his court poet, uh, to, to play on that level of kind of ambassadorial role. That, that would be my off the first thought. I've never, th I've never asked that question to myself before. Um, it's just so impactful, right? In an case, well, I mean, I think more yeah, I, I, but again, this idea of, 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 of literary patronage is in the becoming. That, like I said, Dante, who dies in 1321, this wasn't even a, a thought. It, maybe towards the end of his life, he realizes that he has, he's beholden a little bit to the people that have hosted him and he thanks them in, in parody so he does in Canto 17. But this idea that we have of, of the Medici idea of I'm the patron, you're the client, uh, isn't there yet. So maybe Boccaccio is not playing his cards right. He's not thinking in those terms when he's a 30, 28, 29 year old, you know, having his fun down in Naples where, and maybe Zenobi is. So there's, a, there's, there's probably some personal dynamics going on there. And we definitely know that Boccaccio is the much more committed author. He's much more interested in writing than doing the things that functionaries of a court need to do. Okay. You got two more to go here and then here. Just a quick question. When did the concept of poet laureate become political? Uh, I mean, it, it's, it, I, it, the, the Roman Virgil was a political poet, right? I'm not a classicist, so I, I don't want to invade too much on that, but I think it's always been. It's, it's the state poet. How can it not be political, right? Especially in, in especially in the Roman period, where you know the emperors are choosing the poets. I don't know who the first poet laureate is crowned. I don't I don't have that information, so I can't weigh in. But I think it's always political. I would say that. Yeah. I, maybe not today. We don't we don't consider poets in the same way I think that they did then. Poets are oh they were writing the funny little stuff over there. Poetry here is central to statecraft in in 14th century Florence. In Rome, I think it is too, but I'm not smart enough or don't know enough about Rome to say that without. Yeah, yeah. We, we still have poet laureates in, in UK and they're by royal appointment and they, they tend to be one of the better actual poets of the time. And their job is to be a poet and every so often write a piece of poetry about at a royal occasion, yeah. which they hate doing. And well, they, but they do and it. And nearly <laughs> always do badly, but never mind. Um, there's somebody else wants one here. Thank you for a terrific lecture. Uh, you mentioned early the distinction between poetry and translations mm -hmm. and dropped it. I, I'm just wondering, uh, what was the significance of that difference? That's, again, one of the things that I'm really, that's come out recently, because I just found these, these four Latin epigrams I mentioned that prove that those four figures were the four that people suspected. That spurred me to this question because it, talks about Zenobi in terms of his translating ability. Um, I forget, it's a very particular verb that he uses. Yeah, he says, I, I, I haven't even gotten around to translating it into English yet, but he says, um, potuit cuntos modulamini vates equiperare. You could equate, you could, it's a navigational term, balance between the many different poets from different times. So it's this mediation of as a translator. So that's what they're, that's what he's lauding in Zenobi. Um, is the vulgarizzatore as valued as the poet? I don't think so. But I, I have to I have to think about that, and I have to look around in the 14th century because they all do it. Dante translates a French text, the the Roman de la Rose. He translates it into a little Italian text called the Fiore. We think we're almost positive. Boccaccio and, and Petrarch are both working on translating Homer from Greek into Latin. They don't really get around to much of it, but they're working on it. And a lot of their, a lot of Boccaccio's vernacular texts are really just vulgarizzamenti, translations of Latin texts that he's kind of reformulating in Italian. So, it's part of the toolkit of a, of a, of a literary figure, but, uh, but I'm, I, don't, I don't know if it's valued. 
I suspect it's not, but I, I, that's an area I need to look into. I'm, I'm going to ask uh, Sarah to put up the message for the Zoomers who might want to contribute now. Um, and also ask the Zoomers if they've got any questions they would like to unmute or put on something in the chat. No, uncharacteristically quiet, Zoomers. <laughs> Well, okay. Um, in the room, any more for any more? Yes. Thank you very much for a fantastic lecture. Uh, I was interested in the quote from one of the letters um, uh, where, attracted by the desire of gold, he moved to um, Western Babylon and fell silent. Right. And I just wondered what that meant. You know, did he die or, you know, can, can you explain that? Yeah, I, I can. And, and another comment just at the same time was the change in poetry from the time when they were young men in Naples together and uh, Boccaccio's great love affair during that time. And how did poetry change between that time and when Zenobi uh, became poet laureate. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. Yeah, you're you're right on the first one. You're right. He dies. He dies early. He dies in 1361. So he's born in 13. I, I said 1314 or 13. He's one year younger than Boca. 1314. So he 49, 59. What's that? Someone do the math for me. But okay, he dies young. So he does die young. No, he doesn't say he regrets it. He he he. Let's go back. Let's go. Let's go to the text. Can we go to the text? I have it. Oh, yeah. Well, he said he was envious of glory. Avidius Gloria is the beginning of that. Um, yeah. He, he regretted it. Okay. Um, it's a work in progress. I need that. It's a work in progress. So I haven't thought about that regret yet. But it, I think it has to do with the exhortations that Boccaccio and Petrarch make to him in 1355 to write more. Because he's papal chancellor. He's in Avignon running the papal court. So there's no time for writing. And it's, it's a bit unfair. It's a bit like asking all those bishops to do some bishoping. <laughs> I, I mean, uh, one of the things that emerges immediately is that the Dante belongs to a different generation. It's for uh, Capture and uh, Dante were from France and so on. But there's, and Dante himself was rather strange insofar as he lived at these very provincial courts. I mean, he was out of it. But at, at the same time, after his death, he had this enormous success. So, we're, first of all, we're dealing with the oddity and greatness of Dante mm -hmm. and the, att the attempt to normalize it, if you like. But also that there is an enormous difference that Petrarch himself wanted, self-consciously wanted in comparison with Dante mm -hmm. of his generation and humanism. And the way Boccaccio was very much in that kind of a republic of letters. You see, the one thing that worries me about this and envy and what are, what, when you read the actual authorities that are given. The language is not of that kind. It's in friendship, it's about equality. And after all, Petra could probably, perhaps Bocard, had read Cicero's De Amicitia. It, it, it's all based on other with uh, authorities. <laughs> and when we come to the question of um, munificence, the quotation you give was that as Alexander brought good fortune, well, that's not personalized, please help me. That's if you help me, you will be as great, full of virtue as Alexander, virtu. And what runs through all this and hovers even over Petrarch is fortuna, fate. And even that comes across in friendship. Uh, uh, it, it, that is the it, virtue has to stand against the passing of all misfortunes one after another. I won't call it stoicism, but it's interesting that Dante, for example, sees Fortuna as blind and you can do nothing about it. For Petrarch and Boccaccio, virtue is to some extent to be indifferent or to stand above. This. Why is Zenobi standing a totally different 
longer world outside uh, the Republic of Letters is he's interested in gold. And if anything, gold comes, it goes. <laughs> it's not part of yourself. It's not part of your mm -hmm. virtue. And I could go on. About no, you can, and I, I would like you to. Yeah, no, it's... it's I will finish with this. I mean, of the authorities, the situation is odd because the, most of us, Dante stands as supreme, but as a very odd model. I mean, a very odd. Whereas for Bembo and the Renaissance, it's Petrarch that stands as the outdoors. So he was crowned on the, uh, uh, Yes. For prose. Yes. But it's not, it's not Petrarch of the Latin, no, no, no. but it's Patrick. It's the Tuscan. But now we're already hundred years it's later. It's the Tus Tuscan language. Now we're in Vasari times. We're in Vasari times. Yeah. No, no, it's, it's just, this is great. This shows me that I'll have readers if I ever publish it, right? And and, and excited and and participatory. I can't respond to all this. No, no, no. I, I I agree with you, and I think that uh, there there's there's the 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 pitfall here of psychologizing these people. And, and so I have to be aware of that. And I'll say that the authority thing is well taken, especially that quote about friendship is absolutely stolen straight from Cicero. I would say that that letter, the last one, about the envious of glory, the, the, the quote I wanted you all to read, the most important one, that's not, uh, that's not a model. And um, that's, I would say that that's, that's, that's Boccaccio doing some uh, cultural politics for Petra and himself. And that's why I think it's so important because it, it's not, oh, I can trace this back. It's not even Ovid would say anything like that. Say. Say he was the Avenues court. What was absolutely typical of Petra is the he served a princely cardinal. He was. Uh, Until he didn't. Uh, he went into orders, he couldn't marry. And yet he, he, he it was absolutely, or his, his desire for great public and virtue accompany the mother, Siva, Siva. No, only, only to a certain point. When he moves to Padua in 1360s, he's no longer beholden to anybody. And that's the point I made. And, and so that he's establishing this place, this place to be outside of patronage. And that's why he's hovering above all this. He's trying to position his people because he's become the patron now. He's no longer the client. In Barcelona, but then he left that. I'm, he he, I'm he gonna, talked it out. I'm going to call time on this. Extremely exciting to have <laughs> um, have some real hardcore academic debate going. Oh yeah, no, come on, so, this is good. So, this is, I, I know, I'm going to let you and Alan finish it over the wine because we're going to get there quite soon. But I do want a, a couple more voices before we get to okay. wine. One, on, we've got a Zuma, uh, Brenda, who never lets us down, has come in with. Uh, you said that Dante was never crowned poet laureate. Yet we always see him wearing the laurel crown. Is that because of Boccaccio's biography? Uh, that's partially because of Boccaccio's biography. Absolutely. In the Trattatello Laudi di Dante, which is the biography that Boccaccio writes, that he says, "Damn it, we missed it. We really screwed up Florence, and we should have we should have given him the, the laurel crown." And so I, I think it's reductive to say it's because of Boccaccio, but certainly he's part of this politic politicization. No, part of this cultural move to recuperate Dante back into the Florentine. Absolutely. They, absolutely. they realized they really missed out on that one. Yeah. <laughs> well, they, yeah. And they, uh, it has the bones. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we've just got to get those bones back. If anyone in the you're not going to get in there. They're, they're no, still absolutely. fighting over that. No, I have no, 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 no. You were getting overexcited by the academics. Um, that's <laughs> yeah. going on. I'd say uh, this is this is very hardcore and very wonderful because um, the one thing about our Wednesday lectures, if we cover the whole spectrum from fairly um, sort of 101 kind of things about Michelangelo through to some hardcore new research, which has been disputed. <laughs> Love it. Um, Actively being disputed. That's great. <laughs> that, that, that's very good. Okay, does, um, we will, you guys can continue that after the session. Um, yeah, well, <laughs> mamma mia. <laughs> <laughs> we, 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 maybe we should have a new series of setting up the uh, <laughs> academic <laughs> <laughs> That'd be pretty good. Um, does anyone else have a less inflammatory question or a comment to share with us? No, uh, no, his wasn't. His no, was no, not no, inflammatory. No, no, it wasn't absolutely either. not at all. It was, it was, it was, no, absolutely. And, and, and also pointing out yeah. um, that that I was 
that letter about uh, the, the one where he solicits the patronage, the, the Alessandro Cosimo. Absolutely, he's showing off what I, I could be your poet. Look at what I can do. And so it's very much playing off the typical praise literature that Dante's, uh, Boccaccio's stealing from some Romans that he's Valerius Maximus in particular, and trying to say, look at how good I could be if you, if you give me the chance to be writing about you. And that's why in the later quotes I brought out, that he says, I'm not wasting my energy on this. But how does he do it? In a 17,000 word letter, which is a show off. Look what you missed, Niccolo. Look what you could have had. Look how good I am. What's the Nobi doing? Well, it's the virtuosity which made Patrick translate the last story in. Don't get, now you're going to get me mad. Now you're going to get me mad. He's talking about he's talking about Petrarch translates the Decameron into Latin and changes the story, just like Chaucer. Okay, so we Petrarch versus Boccaccio. It's going to be a good punch up afterwards of the wine. That's fine. Uh, before we move on to the wine and, and punch up, and, and those in the room are welcome to come and watch this. <laughs> uh, okay. pay extra, extra pay for yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm not shedding blood for. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, Zenobi. We've got, a, we've got a pool of mud for you to wrestle with. This thing. No, it's perfect. <laughs> um, but um, has anyone else got any last thoughts before we wrap? Um, I think it's hard out to follow this. It's really good. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, it's brilliant. Thanks, Alan, a lot for your like, contribution. That's really enlivened the debate and it will continue for sure. That's great. Um, it just remains really to thank Jason hugely for. Thank you. For giving so generously of your time and sharing this. This virgin research world is very exciting indeed. Um, yeah, and um, you know, more, more great things to come as we go on. Our usual mixed diet of beautiful music, current affairs, academics, yeah. history of art stories, whatever. Um, keep it coming. And uh, for those in the room, uh, Frescobaldi are our partners this month. And so we've got some nice uh, white wine from Frescobaldi through there for you. Um, and then we'll see some of you tomorrow, some of you next week, whenever. Bye, Zoomers, and have a glass of wine on me at home. Bye. Yeah.